Welcome everyone who's joining us for this jointly hosted webinar with traffic. And I'll, I'll let everyone join for a second and then we'll get started because we have a lot to cover. And while you're joining, um, if you wanna take a moment and just introduce yourself in the chat, let us know your name and where you're joining us from and your interest or your work perhaps. So as I said, we're here to talk about the wild check report, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, um, but that slide is just to let you know you're in the right place. And I also wanted to make sure you were aware that Herbalgram, recent, in the most recent Herbalgram, there was a key feature on the future of frankincense, um, for those of you who want, who haven't seen that and who wanted to have more background on the conservation and use of frankincense. That's a really in-depth article. That's available at the ABC Herbalgram website. And for the upcoming webinars on May 12th, I'm really looking forward to this webinar. I'll be speaking with David Montgomery and Ann Bickley about their research into the, the connection between regenerative farming practices and the constituents in the plants that are grown. And so the inf more information on that is at the Sustainable Herbs Program website. And then have three more webinars to round out um, the year through June. And at the end of May, I'll be speaking with Thomas Guerin around his longtime work in China around growing organic herbs and the Chinese botanical industry in general. And in June, I'll be speaking with Arko Chatterjee about his work working with smallholders, smallholder farmers in India around agroforestry practices for medicinal plants. And then the last webinar on June 16th will be with Jane French from NUMI that has done a lot of really interesting work measuring their carbon footprint and coming up with action steps around how to address that. So more information on all of those is available on the Sustainable Herbs Program website. And as always, these webinars are made possible with the generous support of Sustainable Herbs Program underwriters and donors. And you can find out more information about who these companies are and links to their websites on the Sustainable Herbs Program website. And they're also made possible through the support of ABC members. And you can find out more information about joining at herbalgram.org. And with that, I want to stop sharing my screen and turn to the panel today, um, where, as I said, we'll be talking about the Wild Check Report, which was just released last week. It was produced by Traffic, FAO, and the IUCN Species Survival Commission Medicinal Plant Specialist Group. And it's been great to see the genesis of this report. I knew of it right when it was just an idea several years ago. And the report aims to inspire and support responsible sourcing of the hidden wild harvested plant ingredients found in our everyday beauty, health, and food products. And it includes 12 it includes biological and social risk assessments for 12 flagship species, so the so-called dirty wild dozen. And what the report does is it assesses the biological and social risk and then identifies responsible sourcing opportunities. So it's both a assessment of the state of the situation and then a really call to action. And, and in the conversation today, we're going to talk about both aspects of that. Um, the webinar, as I said, it's in collaboration with Traffic, and it will introduce the report, detail some of the methods and contents, and then look at an on-the-ground example of the frankincense supply, uh, looking at the risks and responsible sourcing. So with, oh, and then I'll introduce the speakers, and then we'll turn to the speakers. It's my honor to be joined by Dana Lehman, who is co-chair of the IUCN Medicinal Plant Specialist Group of the Species Survival Commission. She's a founding member of the Board of Trustees of the Fair Wild Foundation and a co-author of the report. Caitlin Schindler is Traffic's Plant Trade Program Manager 
and the lead author of the Wild Check Report. Anjanette DiCarlo is a lecturer on supply chains at the, U at the University of Vermont and at St. Michael's College, also in Vermont, and is the founder of the Save Frankincense Initiative. And Hilary Somerlet is the founder of Arbor Oils of Africa, and she spent many years exploring the uses of wild, plant, wild African plant ingredients for skincare use and perfumery. So welcome, all of you. It's great to have you here. And Dana, I wonder if you could just start. You have a long history of working with medicinal plants, wild plants, um, across a whole range of topics and with a lot of different organizations. So I wondered if you could just start us off by talking about where wild plants can be found in our everyday products and how their use has changed, changed over the years. So thank you, Anne, and um, it's a pleasure to be here um, speaking about this, um, this new report. Um, I think most consumers and, <clears throat> and industry um, people are, are quite aware <clears throat> of how, um, how many products contain plants they're, you know, pharmaceuticals, whatever herbal products, you know, herbal remedies or um, natural shampoos and all kinds of cosmetics and so on. And it seems that every day there's, <clears throat> there's some new ingredient or some new use for a long, long known ingredient. Um, I think Hillary's talking about frankincense. We'll be a great example of this, how frankincense has returned from being a biblical, um, sort of a biblical uh, um, classic to something that you find in lots of products now. I think what this report highlights is what is really less evident to um, many, um, including many people in the industry and many consumers. Um, is that many of these plants that are sourced for, um, for products are from wild populations, not from cultivation. And what's important about that <clears throat> is that it's very difficult really to, um, to get a handle on what is being harvested sustainably in the wild and what is not being um, harvested sustainably in the wild. And that's something that this report has really tried to highlight using these flagship species and giving a number of examples of the kinds of, of uh, the range of sustainability issues that one will encounter in very commonly encountered um, uh, plant species in, the, uh, in consumer products. Can you talk some about the methods that were used for the biological risk assessment? Yeah, so what my group, what the medicinal plant specialist group, um, um, one of its key focuses is on understanding the conservation status of um, medicinal and aromatic plants around the world. Um, but it, the, we don't have perfect information, Very, a very small proportion of of these plant species have really had thorough global assessments of conservation status. And there are lots of other factors that are, that are equally important to understanding whether something is threatened or how and how threatened. Um, so what we did is we put together, uh, um, it's, it looks like a fairly simple matrix, but it took a long time to come up with a key set of factors, ecological and trade, that can be um, digested in a fairly straightforward way and applied to get a ranking of whether uh, the, the vulnerability to, um, to unsustainable harvest is quite high or medium or low. And we apply this in various contexts, um, CITES and otherwise. Can you give an example of some of those when you said the different indicators um, or, or an example of to help right. us so visualize a little there, more? There are things yeah. like, you know, how, um, how easily a plant is able to regenerate 
um, how long it takes to um, regenerate either an individual or the kind of material that's being harvested. Um, how detrimental or how lethal is the um, type of harvest likely to be? So if you're, if you're uprooting a plant, um, you're killing the individual. And if you're just harvesting leaves or flowers, um, how much are you leaving uh, for um, the, the, that population to be able to regenerate? And so there are those kinds of factors, as well as how many different kinds of harvest is one um, population being subjected to, because a lot of these plant species are used for multiple purposes. And, um, you know, you find trees that are harvested for firewood, as well as for the bark, and you have to take all of these facets into account to understand what a sustainable practice and level of harvest could be. And is so we also... find that from, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I, I was just saying that for, for most of the plant species that we, um, that we look at, including um, this um, wild dozen, these flagship species, um, loss of habitat and degradation of habitat is really the prime threat um, so, but for these commercially important species, um, the sustainability of harvest is also a very, um, a very important threat that is different from, say, all the other plants that are not um, harvested for commercial purposes. And so this, so the two kinds of threats um, uh, interact. Um, so you lose if you have a, a fairly big population, you know, um, a couple of decades ago, and then the um, the uh, habitat is is lost or degraded, you end up harvesting a very small population instead. And so the practice has to change along with the type of threat. And so, so that then following that, who's given that it's not just the harvesting, it's also over loss of habitat. Whose responsibility is it to take action against these threats? So we, we depend a lot on the knowledge and, and practice of the harvesters themselves. Um, but much has changed in their lives as well. And so there, there's loss of just practical knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge. Um, loss of control over management of the resource is a very important element. And then just the level of demand and competition for, um, for resources that um, make it far more complicated for harvesters to be the gatekeepers on sustainability. So the industry itself, I think, is um, really needs to be stepping up to the front line of being aware of what they're sourcing, what their sources are, aware of what the sustainability um, picture looks like for those, um, <clears throat> for those um, resources, for those plants, and aware of what they can do to enable that um, those harvested populations to be um, to be healthy and and continue to be harvested, or find ways to protect species that are really struggling um, to um, to survive, let alone uh, withstand uh, wild harvest. That's great. Thank you for framing it, and which comes to why this report is so important because. From from what I've you know what I've been trying to do research on the industry, it's so hard to get actual information or data on where especially wild plants are from and the state of the health of those. And so, Caitlin, can you maybe introduce the report some and talk about what it brings, what it contributes to this, the challenges that Dana Dana's laid out. Yes, definitely. Thanks, Anne. And hi, everyone. Hope you enjoy the report and reading it after the session. 
So at its core, this wild check report, it aims to make information easily accessible about a flagship set of wild ingredients, which, and Anne already mentioned, the set of the wild dozen that we've focused on. It aims to make the information about them accessible and understandable for a range of important stakeholders who are using or interacting with wild plant ingredients. And we're, help, we're, we're trying to help address this critical first step of not knowing where to start. So you probably are all familiar with, there are thousands of wild plant ingredients that are in use and even in international trade. So it tries to help overcome this question of where do you start? So it helps you identify what are some important wild ingredients to start looking at? What are the risks that need to be addressed in their supply chains? And what are the opportunities that are waiting to be seized? But we wanted to make sure critically through this report that we didn't just highlight the risks surrounding these species and we don't wanna deter trade away from them because these ingredients can be so important in terms of both culture and livelihoods uh, to the communities that harvest them. So in many cases, they support marginalized or low income groups, um, sometimes with few other earning opportunities and the ingredients themselves can be really critical to the ecosystems that they're based in as well. So therefore can also be uh, used as a tool for broader wildlife conservation. So if we take a couple of examples from the report, um, one that I quite like is the Brazil nut. That's one of the wild dozen that we focus on. Uh, so the trees that Brazil nuts come from only grow in the Amazon region and they rely on a healthy rainforest ecosystem to survive. Um, cultivation trials have not been successful with them, so that's quite a neat one that really links into the rainforest. Um, we also looked at baobabs in the report, and baobabs share habitat with the iconic and charismatic uh, African elephant. So again, a neat opportunity to link between the uh, responsible harvest of one and the conservation of the other. Uh, and another one that we looked at is gum arabic. So gum arabic trees are an important, uh, they play an important role in the fight to stop desertification and restore the ecosystems in the Sahel region of Africa. So there are a lot of really great examples through the report of how these ingredients, you know, they face a lot of risks, but they also can provide these really great opportunities for responsible sourcing and also for supporting uh, communities who rely uh, on their harvest. Great. Can you elaborate a little bit on how, on what kind of information is there? How is, is it accessible for industry and other stakeholders? Sure. So yeah, I mentioned that there are you know, thousands of ingredients in wild trade or in the wild plants trade. Uh, so there's approximately 3000 in international trade. So like I said, if you're just starting out, if you're a business or even a researcher um, and you don't know where to begin within those thousands, uh, or if you are already engaging with wild plant ingredients, you know, you're using them and you're deciding where to go next, maybe with your responsible sourcing or your research or your policies, uh, it can be overwhelming. So we narrowed to this flagship list of the wild dozen and we picked those or selected them across a variety of different uh, industries, uh, geographies, and also products that they would be found in. So they give a real starting point when we're describing the types of risks and opportunities that wild plant ingredients can face even beyond that set of the wild dozen. And throughout the report, we also uh, allude to other similar ingredients to the wild dozen that we've gone into detail on. So certainly if you look at the report and you don't see the ingredient that you're interested in listed there, still have a browse through because it's still uh, a good summary and a good starting point. Um, one thing that I wanted to touch on as well within the report is the risk assessments, which so Dan has already done a great job explaining the uh, biological risk assessments. So the purpose of us using those in this report was to translate some of these complex issues that face this really big variety of ingredients uh, into some quick indicators that businesses might be more used to or more comfortable with using. So we produced red, amber, green ratings. 
and then put those alongside some more in-depth explanations and some further resources to explore. So it's really important to look at them in context and not just at the red over green rating, although that does provide a good entry point. Uh, so yeah, we produced both the biological and social risk ratings for the wild dozen. And that was you know, to help businesses who are dealing with a lot of different commodities. So some of the more well-known ones that they might be more comfortable with working with. So like timber, palm oil, or seafood. Um, so to help those kind of businesses uh, understand those uh, these wild ingredients on a similar level to those maybe more familiar commodities. So I've got some examples of some of the risks that we detailed in the report. Uh, so one of the ingredients that we looked at is candelilla wax, which is a common ingredient in cosmetics such as lipstick. Uh, and the social risk assessment uh, found uh, within that that it carries a risk of health and safety and specifically that's because sulfuric acid is used in the processing of candelilla wax. And there were some cases found where workers were not uh, using the correct uh, protective equipment to process that. Uh, there's another one around uh, Brazil nuts, if we go back to my favorite example. So actually Brazil nuts carry some risk of child labor um, and also of poor living conditions for harvesters. Um, they often live in camps in the uh, rainforest while they are harvesting. So yeah, there's a few uh, examples there. Um, I can say a bit more about the methodology that we used as well, um, because we did develop this new uh, methodology for this report, which we're keen to kind of develop further and also see where else we can apply it. So when we created this procedure, um, my personal background is in the food industry in the UK, and we created it to kind of align with that, but also to suit the specific context of wild harvesting. So for the uh, procedure, we used something called the ETI base code as the labor standard against which we assessed. So that's a code which a lot of uh, retailers internationally and especially in the UK use as their reference point uh, for good working conditions. Uh, we took that code and we compared it against the fair wild standard because fair wild standard was developed specifically for the wild harvest. And then we uh, adapted or tweaked that code where it was necessary. So for example, in the base code, there is an element on uh, regular and reliable employment. Um, however, a lot of har harvesters do not harvest the same ingredient year round and they'll have different jobs throughout the year. So we had to adapt it in certain places. Uh, so we considered factors uh, like governance, health and safety, uh, discrimination, forced labor, child labor, living wage. So essentially everything that makes up a good, uh, a good workplace. And then for the assessments themselves, we used a combination of country level proxy indicators, especially where there was data missing. And then we put that alongside ingredient level findings. So, and with the ingredient level findings, in a lot of cases, there is just not enough data to complete the full assessment, um, but we could also use some similar ingredients. So maybe harvested in a similar way or in the same country or by similar groups of people. So and we explained in the report, um, like I said, it's really important to view them in context uh, and uh, also with the disclaimers and further references that we put in there. But yeah, we think it's a really great starting point and also the first of its kind really to be applied to uh, wild ingredients. Yeah, that's really fantastic. And, and just quickly, when, once people have reviewed the report, what next steps should they take? Yeah, sure. So. One of the things that we want to do with the report as well is that, so no individual solution is gonna be like the golden ticket that's gonna solve all these uh, problems that we identified through the report. So what we've done throughout is kind of present uh, a menu of options that people can pick. Um, there's quite a range within those. Uh, so uh, one of the examples uh, is looking at certifications. So we there are a bunch of certifications that you can apply uh, to wild harvested ingredients, so like Fairwild and UEBT, two examples. Um, so that's one option that you could go for. However, there are other ways that you could uh, work towards responsible sourcing as well. So we identify, for example, a lot of partnerships that you could look to pursue um, with 
specific ingredients or in specific regions that can make sure that your actions have kind of a broader impact and more longer lasting. Um, also looking at things like purchasing practices, improving traceability, uh, contributing to better uh, data collection around the ingredients. So yeah, there's quite the, quite the menu in there. And what we've also done is um, we have specific uh, recommendations for each ingredient and then also some general ones at the end of the report. So again, if you don't see an ingredient that is relevant to you or you don't think is relevant to you, still have a look at the report um, in the conclusion section. There's some general uh, opportunities. Great. Well, obviously, we could spend the whole time talking in more detail about the report. And, and Sahar has put the link to the report in the chat for those of you who haven't seen that. But now I, I want to turn to Anjanette and, and to look at one particular case of example of a species. And Anjanette, can you talk, you've worked a long time in frankincense over the years. Can you elaborate on the typical trade structure and how that's changed over time? You're muted. The, the typical trade structure are that these are incredibly opaque supply chains. And what is key, critically important right now is to change that and to have transparency in these supply chains, regardless of what range state frankincense is coming from. We need transparency to be able to understand and track the trade as well as the well-being of the species and the people involved. So um, that hasn't changed much over time. Frankincense has been an opaque supply chain for millennia. <laughs> There's a lot of secrecy around it, the mysticism, et cetera. And so it's, it's something that needs to be modernized in terms of the supply chain to have that transparency. And there's many different ways to do that. And you, you've already touched on some of them. Can you describe what that behind the, behind the scenes, what's happening, you know, how it basically works for those who aren't familiar? Sure. Well, there's, there's quite a little, there's quite a bit of variation from country to country, but uh, resins are harvested generally by men. Um, they're small holders, small land holders, or they're working on government concessions, um, or they're imported labor to, to collect the resins. Um, and then resins are sorted by women, traditionally, uh, pretty much across the range states. And those resins are then internationally traded for many different end uses. So uh, there's you know, long standing use for uh, spiritual purposes, use in church and incense. Um, they're also shipped to be distilled um, into essential oils and also extracted for boswellic acids for use in phytopharmaceuticals. And, and what's the scale? Can you talk a little bit about the scale of that and how that's changed? Sure. Well, if, if you consider that frankincense is one of the oldest existing supply chains, it's a commodity that's been traded for 6,000 years, with today's population pressures and the growing demand for frankincense across the board, not in just one sector, due to population growth and also recognition of frankincense as a highly medicinal uh, resin, it's growing. And so as we see demand growing, we also have to be aware of the pressures on land use and land conversion as well that diminish forest range that have nothing necessarily to do with frankincense directly, but the pressure on the ecology and the reduction of forest period, you know, with something we're dealing with, with climate change, we're recognizing the importance of protecting our forests and how important trees are um, and climate change and so many other things that these dual pressures, this land use conversion, growing population, and also commercial demand puts a lot of pressure on the trees. And then also as a, back to Dana's point about the harvesting practices. Can you talk a little bit about those and the range of um, sustainable, you know, what allows sure. the trees to survive and what overpressures them? Yeah, sure. So, so Boswellia trees produce resin to protect themselves. It's part of their immune system, like many resinous bearing trees, that if they're damaged or a branch breaks off or a boring insect tries to get into the tree, 
the resin canals will heal that, that wound or stop that boring insect. And in some cases, as Hillary will share, it's even a mutualistic relationship between the tree, the resin, and, and, and insects. Um, so the tree is naturally producing the resins. And somewhere along the line, our human ancestors recognized self-exudates coming from trees um, and, began, and began using those and realized that in some of the species that if you tap them, which is to produce, you, know, you make a small scratch in the tree's bark, which is very thin, um, that the resin will exude more and you can collect more. So sustainable processes look something like this. A certain amount of wounds based on the size and age of the tree. And, and that ranges. Then after you know the appropriate amount of wounds for that tree, it's doing it a certain amount of rounds and then letting that tree rest. And that's that critical piece that we see sort of being lost. This resting period, this not everywhere, but in certain places, this ability of the trees to rest and recover. And if that's done, they will recover. Now, the, there's, there's a little bit of debate of whether that's one or two years or more upwards five to 10. Um, some research shows that for the inner bark to heal and for the wound to completely heal takes longer than a year or two. Um, and so we're really, this is something that we, we absolutely need to understand better in terms of rotational management of the trees. And so probably coming out of that, you are the founder of Save Frankincense. Can you talk a little bit about what that is, what it's doing and why sure. you created it? Well, Save Frankincense and the Global Frankincense Alliance are merged and we're one entity. Um, the, the Save Frankincense originally was, it's an initiative. It just, it was something people kept saying. <laughs> you know, we'd, we'd meet with stakeholders or talk with people and everyone agreed it's so important, we need to save frankincense. So we just, we picked up on that buzzword as the, or that phrase to be the umbrella for research efforts that, um, that collect data and information that's all publicly shared. So the initiative aims to research for the, for the public or, and or if that's sponsored or that research um, is funded by external entities that that is still public. It's the caveat has to be made public. And, and I'm thrilled that we're, we've been able to merge with the Global Frankincense Alliance. And we have a few of them here. I saw Dr. Bongers and Denzel here in the chat. And so, so for, for businesses wanting to trade in frankincense or already trading in frankincense or consumers purchasing frankincense products, how, how do they navigate the world of frankincense to, to find what's being responsibly sourced? Yeah, so if I, Talk about that from the consumer perspective. People are confused. You know, I get this question quite often from folks saying, "How would I? How can I differentiate between greenwashing and substantive traceability or sustainable harvest?" And this is something consumer, you know, is an issue for consumers across the board. We're inundated with. There's over 400 certification programs out there. There's voluntary certifications that companies themselves um, design. People are confused and, and they're overwhelmed. <laughs> you know, there's a, it's a lot to ask of the general public to be able to drill into each one of these ingredients. And so people are frustrated around this. There's a perception that Boswellia is an endangered species or even the, the six that are commercially traded are an endangered species. It, there, it's not an endangered species. It's, it's threatened, as we know. Um, and that distinction for the public is confusing. And so for companies, that's a different, that's a different situation. Um, depending on the country, I've worked with companies who, are, who want to be on the ground doing more, feel like security and safety doesn't allow for that. I've seen companies who get right in there anyway. Um, it, it varies. But the bottom line is if, if a buyer doesn't know, isn't able to trace the supply chain to source and have a system of accountability along the way, that's problematic for the company's own sustainability and ability to have a quality supply chain, regardless of whether or not people are being taken advantage of. It's just not a good idea anymore. And hopefully things like the Due Diligence Act that's coming 
for the EU that will require more traceability in supply chains will really be a game changer in terms of how buyers um, are held accountable for being able to have traceable systems. Great, thank you. And again, we could keep talking about that for another hour, but I wanna turn now to you, Hillary, who um, are in Kenya and are really working directly with the frankincense harvesting community um, with your company, Oils of Africa. Can you maybe start talking a, a little bit more about how frankincense is harvested and especially in the communities where you're working? Hello, everybody. <clears throat> um, I'm just giving you a brief background on our Arbor Earls and our focus on Boswellia neglecta in Kenya. So the areas that um, Boswellia neglecta occurs in Kenya is semi-desert and the land use is um, pastoralism. And um, we have two areas where we collect. Um, they're certified organic. Um, they're pretty large, it's about 900,000 hectares combined. Um, the collectors are mainly women. Um, we've been organic certified for the last 15 years. Um, and over that time, we've registered about 1,700 collectors. But at each season, uh, not that much many collectors, it's probably only about 200 who will actively collect. Now, the... Um, the, how they collect, there is no tapping at all. Um, this is different from <clears throat> other Boswellia species. Um, the resin exudation is stimulated by the lava of a bora beetle. And um, they scrape along the bark and this stimulates the trees to produce copious amounts of black resin. This covers the insects um, during their larval stage. It's almost is sort of a, a symbiotic relationship, if you like. And then when the, uh, the, then the uh, larvae pupate in the wood under the resin, and then this dries, and this is the time when the women will go out and collect. So they can, because there's a lot of resin, um, they can collect about 10 kilos a day. They then bring it to the purchase centers on specified days. Uh, we weigh, we pack, we pay, and then the resin's taken to a distillation center and we process it and we sell the essential oils. So I just want to mention some issues that we faced in the frankincense trade. Um, uh, basically on talk about sustainability and working conditions. <clears throat> well, as um, Anionette mentioned, the threats facing the different Boswellias need to be assessed individually. Um, we, Bos Boswellia neglecta doesn't, um, faces relatively few threats as compared to the other Boswellia species. Um, the habitats are not very restricted. Uh, they can semi-desert locations on rocky hilly areas. And because the um, habitat is unsuitable for agriculture, it's not at a risk of land conversions as the case with um, Boswellia papiofera. Um, so um, as Anionette mentioned, the other species are tapped. The collectors can go back at least 11 times to widen these tapping spots. And um, so, and if the trees are over tapped, uh, it makes the uh, trees extremely vulnerable to excessive insect attacks. And this is a high cause of, cause of tree mortality. So uh, with the neglected trees, they're not tapped, they're not weakened. And so there is a certain equilibrium between these insect attacks and the tree survival. Um, another interesting factor is that the community has practiced control over the, uh, the neglect to access. So because the resin is very important in the circumcision ceremonies. And um, previous to 2014, nobody was allowed to collect this resin for sale. Um, so the collectors were actually collecting camifera confusa, 
And this was harvested and sold as Boswellian Eglector because it resembles it in texture, color, and, and aromatic profile. So it's only recently that designated areas have been set aside for collection and other areas for um, <clears throat> the circumcision collection. So I just want to talk also a little bit about the social issues. Um, livestock husbandry for the Samburu is the main source of income. And as I mentioned, um, selling the resin um, is a recent phenomenon. Um, they have a tradition for caring for vulnerable members within the extended families. So unlike in perhaps other Boswellia, a collection of other Boswellia species uh, where there's a tra tradition, uh, poor members are not forced to, to collect the resins because of dire economic circumstances. Now, the uh, collection areas are communal, Any, anyone can collect, so it's men and women, it's not just men. Um, they don't uh, have to sort, um, it's the, the resins are simply mainly used for um, distillation and essential oil. Um, the harvesters generally live quite near the neglect woodlands, and they don't have to travel very far. Um, the bigger travel distances are to the purchase center. So one of the um, questions that I've been, would, would like to reply to is about farewell certification. So we were farewell certified in 2015. And um, we stopped because um, there was, it was very expensive for a small company like us. And um, most buyers were not prepared to pay an extra premium for that. But we will have an audit this year, and I believe the foundation is doing something about customer awareness. Um, so- can I, ask you, can I ask you a question about that? Yeah, what sure. Did you, what impact did the certification, did it have an impact on your practices by going through the farewell certification? No. Not much, no, no. I mean, um, I think it's more just advertising or it's just a cert certification to show that we were sustainable and fair trade practices. But um, whether we are fair while certified or not, I think, I mean, I, as, as I mentioned, um, sustainability is not necessarily an issue. I think it's probably more about um, fair trade practices. And so um, we generally, uh, pay out a lot, the company pays out a lot on the, to, to the communities around us and all the, also the community, collective co communities. We pay for school fees, uh, we pay, pay for medical situations where people are in dire straits. Um, recently we repaired a solar water pump in the collection centre. Um, the women had to walk uh, a, about three hours to uh, uh, sort of dry riverbed water hole to collect. So this has made a big, big difference. Um, we just recently bought a motorbike for a collector organizer and that helps him. Then the other thing is that we moved the purchase center uh, near the Boswellia forests. This helps reduce the uh, distance they have to travel. Um, we pay cash on delivery. And this means that every time we go out to these remote areas that we have to travel with large amounts of cash. It's about 3,000 to 5,000 euros. And that's quite risky because um, it's very remote. There's no network and there could be ambushes. So we have to sort of go at, you know, different times early, <clears throat> very early in the morning or for sort of unpredictable times. Um, the collectors are given receipt books, so everything's recorded there, how much they collect, how much they're paid. Um, this is transparent. Um, they can rely on us to purchase, so we buy from them, whether we, we know what our customer orders are or not. So we do uh, bear a risk in, in holding stock. Um, so... Then I think the next question really is, you know, what opportunities are there in harvesting and trade? And how could businesses take advantage of 
to support them? Well, I think uh, industry has the greatest influence. Um, they could be a bit more adventurous. They could perhaps uh, invest in product development with Boswellia Neglecta. I mean, it is actually a very pleasant oil when it's properly distilled, it's uh, fruity, and um, it could be easily used in many products. They don't just have to stick to the conventional Boswellia species. Um, they could be a bit more committed in giving us predictions at the beginning of the year, <clears throat> you know, in terms of how much they would like to collect, because we have no idea. Um, it's always, um, can we have 25 kilos in two weeks time or, you know, 50 kilos next week. <clears throat> so we've got no idea about, it's a very unpredictable market. Um, the other thing is if the plants are categorized as high or medium risk, I think it should be mandatory that the industry buys from sustainably sustainable sources only. Um, what are the benefits to local people for harvesting? Um, there's a huge benefit. Um, they've got, it gives liquidity. Um, it's cash in the hand. Um, you know, during droughts, uh, livestock die or they may be eaten. And so the gum collection is a lifeline for food security. And um, it has given the women a certain independence in their, you know, independent income. Um, the other thing was the other question is, mm. are there other species out in this um, arid land, semi-desert, which could be harvested, which could be useful to the communities? There are many, uh, most coniferous produce um, a sort of resin, and a lot of them could be mm. of important economic value. Um, but the problem is they're very difficult to identify. Um, eminent botanists can't agree on their classification. And so in that stage, we're in a taxonic, taxonomic limbo. And so if a, a species doesn't have a, an agreed name, um, this uh, resource cannot be uh, fully investigated. So um, if uh, otherwise, um, a, very ex a much more expansive use of the many, many different uh, resource possibilities of, of these coniferous and boswellias, it would um, greatly enhance the livelihoods of these people living in these marginalized areas. Thanks. Great, thank you so much for that breadth of information and local, mm -hmm. local perspective. And now, Caitlin, I wanted to turn to you to kind of connect this case study of frankincense back to the report. Yes, definitely. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Internet and Hillary, for the specific example. So, yeah, uh, frankincense is one of the wild dozen that we focus on in the report, and that's why we're speaking about it as one of the uh, examples today. Um, so, these wild dozen profiles, they aim to kind of synthesize all of this complex, confusing, and also um, granular information into kind of a simple and high level reference document. So one thing to note with the profiles is that we focus on individual species and this was necessary to carry out the biological risk assessments. Um, but we also explain where the common name that's in use can refer to multiple species and frankincense is an example of that. So within the uh, wild check report, we focus on Boswellia sacra, and you might have heard uh, Hillary and Internet make a few uh, references to that as well, um, but just to note that. And so for frankincense, for Boswellia sacra, um, it's sourced, or the species that we focus on within the report, it's sourced primarily from Yemen, Oman, Somalia, Somaliland, and Puntland. And as Hillary noted, this particular species is harvested through making small cuts in the tree's bark. So we covered a lot of the uh, risks or threats that face the species. So uh, things like overharvesting, uh, land conversion, uh, livestock overgrazing as well. Um, some risk elements relate to its biology. So um, this particular species, Boswellia sacra, is quite adapted to the specific uh, areas that it's found in, um, which are mountainous desert woodland habitats. 
so overall, we assigned it a risk rating of medium within the report for its biological risk. Um, the social risk rating for this species came out as high, and there's a few reasons for that. So at the country level in Somalia and Yemen, there are some ongoing internal conflicts in those countries, um, which means that the rule of law can't be guaranteed to uphold workers' rights, such as freedom of association. Um, and it also means, this instability means that uh, Somalia and Yemen have a high vulnerability to modern slavery. Um, but this is one of those areas where we would say, again, read the report carefully. Um, it's not saying that it definitely occurs. It's just saying this is something that we might need to be cautious of when we're sourcing in these regions. Um, some other uh, areas of risk there were around, so frankincense harvesting, as Hillary really explained in great detail for this other species, um, it can be some vulnerable families' main earning activity, uh, and this can mean that they are at the mercy of price fluctuations and also demand um, and resource availability as well. Uh, and yeah, also in Somaliland specifically, um, there are some discrimination uh, issues with women as well um, in terms of land ownership. So there's a few issues that we can look at, um, which again, it's just saying these are areas which we need to be aware of and which we need to look into in more detail when we're sourcing from these regions. So it's kind of a first step in that process of due diligence. Um, and we also have some opportunities that we identified as well. Um, we have touched on quite a few of these already. So investing in uh, more research on the species and better data about the harvest um, to understand the resource base better and inform responsible harvesting strategies. Um, also contributing to the conservation of other species through sustainable harvest of frankincense. So another example that we can relate it to some charismatic uh, species is the critically endangered Arabian leopard shares its habitat, as well as uh, some of the same threats with frankincense trees in Oman. Um, and they're also uh, frankincense trees are important in the Great Green Wall Initiative, which is combating desertification in the region. Uh, and again, we can look at certifications and partnerships with other organizations. So like say frankincense and the Global Frankincense Alliance. So yeah, I think the specific details that we've gone into, it's a really good case study, but we can kind of link it all back up to the report and um, keep in mind that this report is quite a high level introduction to all of these different species. So it's meant to be a really good starting point from which you could go into greater detail in the specific regions and species that you are sourcing. Um, great, the, the, we have a second few minutes for a couple of questions. And I, I see Dana is typing an answer to this one, but I also wanted to ask it out loud. Does traffic have any information on good impact case studies on biodiversity conservation or regeneration of wild collected dozen? Examples of good practices for positive impact that companies could look at. Yes, it's a okay. great question. <laughs> Thank you, anonymous asker. Um, so one good example that we can highlight, which also ties into the wild check report is jatamansi, um, which is a medicinal plant harvested in the Himalayas. Uh, so traffic has been working on the species as well as Himalayan plants uh, at a broader scale um, for quite a while, and we have a project going on still there. Um, so we've been working in the region. So the, the plant itself is critically endangered um, and its harvest has been quite restricted, but also the harvesters in the region um, really depend on these types of plants uh, to earn income. So yeah, traffic's work in the area has, I think we have a, a link that we can drop in the chat, but yeah, traffic's work in the area has been to uh, facilitate its responsible trade, um, to gather data and put into place harvesting plans, uh, and also to work with the legal frameworks that allow trade. So uh, Jadamedzi is uh, CITES Appendix 2 listed. So there are some very specific legal requirements that need to be met in its trade. So we've also been working with the harvesters and the processors and the government in that country as well to kind of put it all together and help facilitate uh, responsible and sustainable trade of this species even though it's critically endangered um, because it is so important to the local harvesters there. So that's a really good uh, example. Um, and here's another question. And I'm not sure if 
if any of you can address this, but um, it's around traceability and whether the com perceived competitive advantage companies gain by not revealing where they source ingredients to competitors. If they do allow that traceability, they may risk losing their suppliers. Um, that would perhaps lengthen lead time due to pressures of higher demands on their suppliers and more competing projects, products coming to market sooner. Do any of you want to comment on that? Maybe sure. I'll turn to you, Anya. Yeah, because you were commenting. Uh, I mean, on that. there's plenty of supply chains that are traced now, and really, you know, in many other industries, this is commonplace, and everything's traceable unless you don't want it to be. The system that it is now is not working for conservation and knowing for sure that people are being treated ethically. So we, we have a greater risk not tracing. And I also believe, and, and some folks from Fairwell could speak to this, you can do traceability that then is not shared with the public necessarily, it's shared with the certifier and that information is protected. So there's different ways to do it um, without exposing your specific company. And, and I should say that um, there's, there's people becoming Fairwell certified with large amounts of frankincense, you know, hundreds of tons. Um, and this is a big breakthrough and that's, that's just occurred recently. And so, you know, our, our thoughts on this are changing. Gen Z wants to know where things come from. The, the, the tide is shifting and we need to figure out ways to get traceability um, with, with, without causing great risk to your, to your bottom line and to your supply chain. And there's ways to do that. Does anybody else want to comment on that question? I would just add that. So even before, before my plants, I saw I worked in seafood and there, I think there's a lot of great examples from seafood as well of pre-competitive collaborations where you don't need to, as Anjanette said, you don't need to reveal your specific suppliers. You can talk about regions and species and things without revealing commercially sensitive information. And I think that's really key as well to being able to make bigger scales of changes in responsible sourcing. Um, so yeah, there's definitely ways to do it and we can look to other industries for good examples of that as well. Right. Can I say one more thing on that, sure. Anne? Yeah. You know, the due diligence laws is, is, is gonna be binding. So we have to figure out ways to handle traceability that address the different corporate concerns, but also the conservation and ethics and due diligence is going to cause a shift in that. Is going to be required. Mm -hmm. We might as well get ready now. 2023, it comes on, it comes into effect. Great. And that's something that at the Sustainable Herbs Program, we're really working on doing is that pre-competitive conversations among members and things like that. I wanted to turn to a very specific Boswellia question by Feather Jones. How much resin waste is generated when making essential oils of Boswellia? And I love this question because I feel like not enough attention is paid to the waste that's generated. So. Yeah, it's a great question. Can, can I jump in on that one? Um, if, if you're just distilling for essential oil, you have the heavier components left over after hydro distillation. And within those heavier components are the boswellic acids, which are essentially a biomarker for almost all the boswellias except for one, and are highly medicinal, highly anti-inflammatory. There's a lot of research substantiating this. And so it's a lost opportunity and that has been recognized by many of the big essential oil producers of how, can they recover the boswellic acids and extract it from the post distillate material. Um, it, it also goes in the other direction. Extractors who are extracting for boswellic acids are also missing out on the opportunity to be producing essential oils in that process. And so we're seeing more and more uh, companies doing R&D into how to do both. I can answer how we do our, was, uh, our waste. Um, hello? Yes, please do. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so um, we are, I don't think there's any boswellic acid in Boswellian neglecta. I mean, it has been tested, but um, we um, use the waste as fuel to, we put it back into the boiler. It has a very high calorific value. And so we use it as the fuel to uh, fire up the boiler to produce the steam for the extraction of the essential oil. So it's <clears throat> totally recycled. 
Um, there is one more quick question. I know we're coming to the end, and but Dana, I wondered if you wanted to comment on this, briefly comment on the current attempts to list Boswellia species under CITES by Albert. Are these attempts justified? Dana, do you have anything to say? Gosh. Um, I'm not directly involved in, in, those, um, in those discussions. Uh, I know that um, it would be incredibly helpful um, to have better conservation status information about um, the Boswellia species that are, that are being considered under CITES. Um, but the, I think I just want to point out that um, that conservation status assessment and and CITES listing are not um, are not the same thing, and so you, um, the con the concern of the uh, CITES secretariat and the parties who are um, who are proposing this consideration is that there is um, that sustain that the heart the sustainability of harvest and um, uh, legal trade versus illegal trade um, in in um, these species is um, um, is contributing to the uh, uh, is detrimental to the survival of Boswellia species so. Again, I'm I'm sorry that I'm not really up to date on where that discussion is at the moment. That's great, thank you. We have come to the end of the hour, and clearly we could keep talking on and on. But I want to thank all of the panelists so much for taking the time and for your thoughtful presentations. And I also want to just share my screen again to share some of what you can do now. Next. Um, so you can download the report from the FAO website. It's also on Traffic's website and the link has been in the chat. Um, if, for consumers and individuals, all of us can, can search for wild plant ingredients in our household products and share them on social media using I found wild. Um, there's a pledge for businesses, we use wild. And you can contact wildcheck at traffic.org for more information on finding that pledge and just in general to collaborate and to stay tuned for the Wild Check platform, which is the online version of the report and should be available soon. And so thank you again, everyone, for joining today. We will share the recording shortly. Thank you. <laughs>